Well, friends, I'm sitting here in my basement, and I want to share with you some exciting news about our church's reopening in just a few days' time. We've all been stuck in places like this and not being able to gather together, and it's so exciting to finally say we are going to be opening again for in-person worship at Clarely Park Presbyterian Church, beginning on Sunday, November the 14th. It's been 86 Sundays apart, but on Sunday 87 we'll be together again. The session and the reopening task force have met together a number of times to plan how best to gather together for worship because the well-being of our worshiping community, our church family, is very important to us. The the in-person services will only be available to those who have proof of double vaccination, and we ask for your prayers and your patience as we follow the guidelines so that everyone feels comfortable and safe. And of course, we'll continue to evaluate the changes made and adjust as necessary in the weeks to come. Here's some items of information for reopening. The service will now commence at 10.30 a.m., which will allow us to clean up the sanctuary before our friends in the Spanish congregation arrive later in the afternoon. This new time will remain in place all year round. Everyone who'd like to attend worship must pre-register no later than Friday morning at 9 a.m. if they want to come to church on the following Sunday. You can pre-register either by leaving a message on the church answering machine at 416-759-3901 or by emailing the church at clairelee at clairelee Park Presbyterian dot ca. For the first few weeks, we're going to limit our number to 30 worshipers in attendance. We hope to expand that number very soon, but for a few weeks at least, we want to work out the procedures and processes, especially those of us who are giving leadership to the worship service. Um, if the number 30 has already been reached, by the time you submit your, your, uh, uh, your request, then you will be contacted and given f- first preference for worship the following Sunday. We won't be able to have any walk-ins at this time, and we ask that you arrive by around 10.20 in the morning to allow our service to begin promptly. We will be continuing to record our worship services and share them with those who are not able to attend in-person worship on YouTube, as we've been doing for the last year and a half. One final note about our worship service, instead of passing the offering plate, it'll be situated at the entrance to the sanctuary, and you can place your financial offerings in the plate, and it will be dedicated during the service. When you come into the sanctuary, you'll need to be wearing your mask. Masks must be worn at all times, and if you forget yours, there will be masks available. On the initial visit, the first time you come back to worship, you need to show proof of your double vaccination record and sign a liability waiver for our church. And every time you come to worship, for the foreseeable future, you will be asked to uh, those four screening questions. If, if you're not feeling well, please stay at home. An elder will direct you to your seat, and for the safety of all the other worshipers, we would ask that you remain in that place for the duration of the service. If you reside with other members of a household who are attending, then of course you can sit together, but otherwise, please kindly maintain the social distancing requirements of where you are seated. At this time, we will not be allowing children to attend worship who are 
who are under the age of 12 who have yet to receive a COVID-19 vaccine. We hope that will come very soon, and we will revisit this decision as soon as the vaccine is available to them. When the service is over, we'll be exiting the sanctuary, and the elders will dismiss you starting from the back of the church and moving up to the front. And you can stand and exit the service. Please exit as quickly as you can and and interact and talk with each other once you get out the door. Uh, We won't be having our coffee time in the basement just yet. We understand, of course, friends, and respect as a matter of freedom that during these difficult times, some of you may choose to stay home, so don't feel under any pressure to return just yet. Take advantage of our online worship services as you have been these last many months. May the God of all hope fill us with the peace of Christ and a sense of belonging, because we belong to him and to one another. We look forward to being together again. Hello, friends, and welcome to worship for Sunday, November the 7th, 2021. This is the sanctuary of Clarely Park Presbyterian Church, where I'm happy to say a week from today we will be reopening for the first time in many months. Praise the Lord. If you're visiting with us, we're so glad that you have chosen to take this time to spend time with God in this hour of worship. We're meeting in our worship service today, just a few days before Remembrance Day, November the 11th, this coming Thursday. And so we will begin our worship with an act of remembrance for those who lived and died in the service of others in our nation's armed forces. And then we will continue to come to the Lord to feast on his word and scripture and sermon and at his table as we celebrate the Lord's Supper. So you may want to get a piece of bread and a glass of juice or wine to prepare for that part of the service. Today I want to pay special tribute to three people in our church family who have served in the Canadian Armed Forces. To Mel Germain, who served with the Canadian Reserves in Nova Scotia. To Glenn Fenton for his four years of service in Germany with the Canadian Air Force in Baden-Baden, and to Denise Gordon, who served as Sergeant Major of the 7th Toronto Regiment of the Royal Canadian Artillery. Thank you so much for your service.
in Flanders Fields. In Flanders Fields, the poppies blow between the crosses row on row that mark our place. And in the sky, the larks still bravely singing fly, scarce heard amid the guns below. We are the dead, short days go. We lived, felt on, saw sunset glow, loved and were loved, and now we lie in Flanders Fields. Take up our quarrel with the foe. From you, from failing hands, we throw the torch. Be yours to hold it high. If ye break faith with us who die, we shall not sleep, though poppies grow in Flanders Fields. Hear these words as we are called into worship. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Let's lift up our hearts to the Lord. Let's worship him in song. Dear friends, let's pray to the Lord. Heavenly Father, your mercies are new every morning. We bless you and thank you for meeting with us this day. Lord Jesus, stand among us now in your risen power and make yourself known to us today in our prayers and our praises. Speak to us through the Bible as we hear it read and taught. Deepen our time of fellowship with you and with one another and reveal yourself to us in the breaking of the bread to the praise and the glory of your name. Almighty God, you love us, but we have not always loved you. You call to us, but we haven't always listened. It's so easy for us to walk away from neighbors in need, wrapped up in our own concerns. It's so easy to tune you out and ignore your presence beside us and fail to hear the message you're trying to send us. Oh God, forgive us. Wake us up to your presence and help us to acknowledge our sin 
so that as you come to us in mercy, we will repent and turn to you and receive forgiveness through Jesus Christ, our Redeemer. Amen. Friends, the scriptures say that the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. I declare to you in the name of Christ, you are forgiven. And may the God of mercy who forgives you all your sins strengthen you in all goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit keep you in eternal life. Amen. And the peace of Christ be with you. And I receive that peace from you. Be sure to extend Christ's peace to others this week. church family. Our reading today is from the book of Genesis chapter 32 verses 22 through 31. Let's hear God's word together. During the night Jacob got up, took his two wives, his two servant wives, and his eleven sons and crossed the Jabbok River with them. After taking them to the other side he sent over all his possessions. This left Jacob all alone in the camp, and a man came and wrestled with him until the dawn began to break. When the man saw that he could not win the match, he touched Jacob's hip and wrenched it out of its socket. Then the man said, let me go, for the dawn is breaking. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. What is your name? The man asked. He replied, Jacob. Your name will no longer be Jacob, the man told him. From now on, you will be called Israel because you have fought with God and with men and have won. 
Please tell me your name, Jacob asked. Why do you want to know my name? The man replied. Then he blessed Jacob there. Jacob named the place Peniel, which means face of God. For he said, I have seen God face to face, yet my life has been spared. The sun was rising as Jacob left Peniel and he was limping because of the injury to his hip. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, the title of my message today is A New Passport. Some journeys require a passport. A passport proves that we are who we say we are. It's, it's a way to confirm our identity to others. But the trouble with our passport photos or the picture of ourselves on our driver's license or our health card is that they usually are not a very good indicator of who we really are. My pictures look like I've just woken up and gotten out of bed in the morning. <laughs> How about yours? You know, people are always looking for a way to communicate their identity. Some people have even used newspapers to do that. Back in the day, before, before the advent of online relationship websites like eHarmony and Match and Dating.com, the newspapers would run a section called the personals. Do you remember those? It was a form of classified advertising where a person would try to find another person for friendship or romance or marriage. And here are some examples of some personals that I came across a while ago. Listen to how some people have tried to package their identities in just a few words. Unhappily married, fun-loving, professional male in 40s seeks a single woman for fun, dining, and romancing. Hmm. Single male seeks close relationship, but not marriage, with tall, attractive female, vegetarian preferred. Well-rounded female who is tired of dieting is looking for male in mid-40s, interested in a growth opportunity, interests, TV, and eating. <laughs> Single male, five foot five, looking for small woman. Interests are music, movies, golf, and backgammon. Send picture. How about this one? Soon to be paroled male, looking for serious single female to correspond with. In 20s and aiming at self-improvement. College professor and Marxist sympathizer looking for an educated man who wants to help change the world. Must love cats. <laughs> Serious-minded male in 50s wants to meet like-minded female. No smoking, drugs, or divorce. Must like classical music and museums. Honest Christian gentleman, mid-50s, seeking serious, faithful lady in her 40s for marriage. If honest and faithful, please apply. <laughs> well, you know, whatever their intentions, honorable or otherwise, these people are trying to meet their soulmate by putting them, themselves out there like a commodity presenting themselves as a, a package made up of age, gender, habits, and interests. But somehow, their personhood is getting lost in the process. And in our own day, Facebook can do the very same thing to us. Facebook gives us a chance to share ourselves with the world on our profile page. It's meant to show who we are our interests and friends and family and background and life experiences. But the danger of Facebook is the temptation to share only a carefully curated image of ourselves showing just the best parts that we want to share, constructing a profile that's beautiful or glamorous or humorous or brave or whatever. 
but it's not a true description of who we really are inside, the true person. You know, in the Christian worldview, there is a cosmic battle going on between God and the powers of spiritual darkness for our very souls. And exactly what is your soul? Your soul is who you really are. It's your very essence. It's your identity. It's what God had in mind for you before you were born. And if we give that up, then we've lost everything. That's what Jesus says in Mark 8, verse 36. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? What good would it be to, to get everything you want and lose you, the real you? What could you ever trade your soul for? I believe this ancient battle between God and the enemy of our souls continues to this day. Those personals I read from the newspaper and the incomplete Facebook profiles that we read are evidence of powerful forces at work in our world that want to rob us of our identity. Forces that say you're not a person, but a commodity, a thing, a number. Look in your wallet and you'll see how you're identified. To the federal government, you're a social insurance number. To the banks, you're a credit card number. To the phone company, you're a 10-digit phone number. To Canada Post, you're a six-digit postal code. Years ago, a popular movie suggested that we could rate members of the opposite sex by numbering them on a scale of 1 to 10, uh, 3 being mediocre and 10 being drop-dead gorgeous. But you know, when we categorize other human beings as a 3 or a 5 or a 7 or a 10, we're reducing them to commodities. One of the devil's goals is to reduce and diminish our humanity, to shrink our identity into something other than who we really are, God's child. And so to an atheist, we're simply rational animals living on earth by accident with no ultimate meaning. To some market-driven capitalists, we're just another consumer meant to serve the gods of free enterprise. To some employers, we're just a unit of work, an expendable resource to be used and then discarded when we're no longer productive. To some in the educational bureaucracy, students become a nameless faceless commodity, filling up classrooms without any real concern to form a child's character and impart wisdom to them. And friends, for some of us, even members of your own family have labeled you, criticized you, slotted you into some category that has reduced your real humanity. They didn't know you for the person you really are. Well, friends, if you've ever felt like that, then I've got good news. One of the central messages of the Bible is that when it comes to, the, to an encounter with the living God, we discover that God wants to give us a name, our true name. And God wants to reveal our identity to us, our true identity. And one of the Bible's main examples of this kind of encounter is the story that Norma read for us a few minutes ago of Jacob wrestling with that angel by the river Jabbok. This strange encounter between God's representative and Jacob happened in a lonely valley by a stream of water in what is now part of the country of Jordan. This river Jabbok is a small stream that feeds into the Jordan River. It took place more than 3,000 years ago when Jacob, the conniving son of Isaac and Rebekah, was facing the crisis of his life. Jacob's past had finally caught up with him. He had cheated his brother Esau. 
He deceived his father Isaac. He had tricked his father-in-law Laban. He had spent his whole life cheating and tricking and deceiving others. And the consequences of all those devious actions were now crashing in on him. His angry brother Esau was bearing down on him, threatening to kill him. It was the dark night of the soul for Jacob as he wrestled with God's representative all night long. His opponent had crippled him, but Jacob persevered. And just before dawn, Jacob said, I will not let you go until you bless me. Jacob sensed that this was some kind of a spiritual struggle. This was an encounter. And he wanted to cling to this, this representative of God for God's blessing. And at that point, the angel said to him, who are you? And Jacob responded, I'm Jacob. Jacob is the name his parents had given him. Jacob and his brother Esau were twins. Jacob was the second to come out of Rebekah's womb and was born trying to grab his brother's heel and push himself out first. He was always striving and conniving and scheming and cheating. In Jewish custom, the firstborn son would receive the lion's share of the inheritance and the second a much smaller portion. This little infant Jacob arrived in this world struggling to cut to the front of the line and supersede his brother. And so a power struggle began very early on as it does in some of our families even today. Those who witnessed this unusual birth and saw his outstretched hand gave him a name that marked him for life. The name Jacob literally means he grasps the heel, which was a Hebrew idiomatic way of saying he's a deceiver, he's a cheater, he's a supplanter. And so little Jacob went through his life bearing that name ringing in his ears. Say hello to Jacob, the little cheater. Look at little cheat. But little cheat grew up and fulfilled the promise of that name. And he became a big cheat. His family named him something that perhaps they thought was, was cute or funny. But it was a destructive, harmful word that had a profound influence on Jacob and shaped his life. And he lived out that legacy of cheating with all, almost everyone who came his way. Well, friends, what name did your family give you? Who are you in their eyes? Did they say, here comes that mess? Here comes the clumsy one? Here comes our problem child. There goes the rebel. Or did they say something like, here comes our little darling, the precious one who can do no wrong. Somewhere along the line, the family name that we have been given, the label that we have been tagged with, sticks to us. And you become the person that your parents perceived you to be. And most of us tend to become what we were called or labeled. Or perhaps even though your parents didn't give you a name with a negative connotation, they communicated somehow verbally or non-verbally that you are of less worth than you really are. Brooks Adams, the son of Charles Francis Adams, a former American ambassador to Great Britain many years ago, tells the moving story from his boyhood. His father, who was a very busy and important man, once took his son fishing with him for a whole day. This busy father who had uh, so little free time uh, gave this day to his son. And Brooks, the boy, recorded that day in his, in his diary, spent the day fishing with my father. It was the most glorious day of my life. 
He'd had his father's attention for one whole day, uninterrupted. And ever after, he kept referring to that day as a day that had shaped and changed his life. But years later, after his father died, he came across his father's diary. He found his dad's diary, and he looked up the entry for that memorable day, and here's what he found. His father had written, Spent the day fishing with my son, a wasted day. His father may have cared for his son, but nevertheless, a day spent with his little boy was a wasted day. You know, if you were made to feel unimportant or uncared for by your parents, they have given you a discouraging identity. You know, even Jesus was labeled. We read in John's Gospel when Philip tried to convince his friend Nathaniel that they'd found the Messiah, and when Nathaniel learns that this is Jesus of Nazareth, Nathaniel exclaims, Nazareth? Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Nathaniel was prone to labeling people by their regional roots, and society still does that. Oh, you're a newfie. <laughs> oh, you're an American. You're from the prairies, or you're from Lotus Land, the left coast. Right away, we project an image of what we think you're like. You're already in a box because you're from Rosedale or Oshawa, from Seattle or Guelph or Guyana. I think it's all part of the devil's plot to take away our individuality. We are labeled by all sorts of things, our age, our income level, our job, the groups we belong to, even the church we attend. And in this whole matter of identity, I believe that God wants to give us three amazing gifts. First, he wants us to know whose we are. We belong to him. The precise words in the Bible are, you did not choose me, but I have chosen you. That's what Jesus said to his disciples. To, to those who place their faith and their trust in him. They acknowledge Christ's call. And when we do that, when we say yes to the Lord, we know whose we are. We know who we belong to. We know our truest, deepest identity. We are God's beloved children. The most important decision any of us can make is to say yes to God's great affirmation of us in the cross and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But after we've settled whose we are, God can give us the gift of knowing who we are. When Jacob wrestled with the angel, he was really wrestling with God, who was asking him, who are you? And when Jacob answered, I'm a cheat, God gave him a new name, erasing the name that his parents had given him. God says, you are now Israel, which means one who strives with God. His old name, Jacob, was a reminder of his grubby past, but his new name, Israel, was a promise of future triumph that God would pour out his blessing upon his people through Jacob and his descendants. And from that moment on, the cheater became a leader from whom all believers ever since have been named. We Christians, the, the New Testament affirms, we are the new Israel. We've been named for the patriarch Jacob, whose name was changed. Jesus gave Nathanael a new identity as well, by the way. That same Nathanael who was so ready to label other people by their hometowns. We don't know what Nathanael's parents had in mind when they named him or what, what meaning that name took on in the family structure. Stupid Nathaniel, lazy Nathaniel, or intelligent, industrious Nathaniel. But when Jesus, when Jesus meets this Nathaniel, he says, 
Look here. Here is a rare specimen, an Israelite in whom there is no guile, no pretense, no deception. He tells it like it is. There aren't many of those around now, Israelites or Presbyterians. Most of us have a lot of guile. But Jesus saw a man, Nathaniel, who was transparent with no hidden motives. He saw him for who he really was. Dear friends, God can do that for you and me as well. People around us, our parents, our spouse, our friends, they may never understand who we really are, but God does. Jesus gave a new name to his disciple Simon as well. He believed in him, believed that he would no longer be the impetuous, vacillating person he had been. So Jesus named him Peter, the rock. And Peter became a rock of faith, the head of the church in Jerusalem. It's so freeing to realize that we are special in God's eyes. I read about Harvard University when it was celebrating its 300th anniversary some years ago. During the celebration, the first year students came marching down the street carrying a banner that said, Harvard has been waiting 300 years for us. <laughs> In, instead of worrying about their worthiness to be at a school of, with such an awesome tradition, they believe that their presence could bring about Harvard's finest hour. That's the kind of hope that God gave to Jacob when he gave him that new name of Israel. But after we find out whose we are and who we are, we discover that we're not alone. God gives us a new family, who we belong to. It's a family of God's choosing, not ours, and we're meant to be a gift, God's gift, to one another. God tells us whose we are and who we are and where we belong. We belong to each other. We are to be blessings to the people around us, giving each other new names, calling forth hidden gifts, being ministers and servants to each other. I still remember the impact of particular people at different points of my life that have made an indelible impact on the person that I've come to be. They cared for me and accepted me just as I was. They extended grace and forgiveness to me when I didn't deserve it. They spent time with me and saw potential in me. They helped me discover gifts that I didn't know I had. They made me feel special and loved and helped me, by the grace of God, become a better version of myself than I ever could have been without them. They were God's gifts to me. And that's what we're called to be for one another. Dear friends, you and I have that same power to communicate to others that they are special, that they are unique, that they are beloved by God. At home, at work, at school, in our neighborhood, in this congregation, we can let people know that they matter to God and therefore they matter to us too. The word of the Lord came to the prophet Jeremiah, and here's what Jeremiah wrote down in chapter 1, verse 5. God said to that young man, Jeremiah, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you, and before you were born, I consecrated you, I set you apart, I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. That doesn't just apply to Jeremiah. God thought of you before you were born and before your parents were born. And God called you by name with a unique identity to live out and serve the Lord in your days. God has a new identity for you. He still does. 
Don't ever settle for anything less. He'll issue you a brand new passport. And you might even like the picture. <laughs> Amen. Friends, let's lift up our hearts to the Lord. Let's pray together. Father of mercy and God of all comfort, we pray to you this morning for all who have suffered because of war, for the injured and the disabled, for the mentally distressed, for those whose faith in you and, and in humanity has been weakened or destroyed because of what they've seen or experienced. We pray for those who are suffering from the results of war, even today, for people who are homeless, for refugees, for those who are hungry, for those who have lost their livelihood and their security. Oh God, we remember today before you places of civil unrest and warfare in our world for Ethiopia and Eritrea, for the civil war going on in Yemen, for those suffering economic unrest in Afghanistan, and for other places and people that are known to you. 
We remember, Lord, those who've lost loved ones, husbands or wives, children or parents, and especially those who have no hope in Christ to sustain them in their grief. Lord, show us ways to be channels of your peace right where we live, and we pray for your church around the world called to be agents of your reconciling love. We pray, O oh God, for our own church family, especially in these days as we anticipate reopening to have worship again in our sanctuary. We ask your blessing on all the details. It'll be wonderful, Lord, to be able to be together again. And we pray that you'd pour out your healing mercy on those who are recovering for Bob Hurd and for Mel and Stella and Glenn, for Fred Clark and others known to you, Lord. Lord, we look to you to be our strength and our healer. In Jesus' name, amen. Jesus said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If those who hear my voice open the door, I will come in to them and eat with them, and they with me. O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Happy are all who find their refuge in God. Let's sing now this hymn as we prepare for the Lord's Supper. Friends, let's lift up our hearts to the Lord and give our thanks and praise to our Savior. Holy God, we praise you. Let the heavens be joyful and the earth be glad. We bless you for creating the whole world, for your promises to your people Israel, and for Jesus Christ in whom your fullness dwells. Born of Mary, he shares our life. Eating with sinners, he welcomes us. Guiding his children, he leads us. Visiting the sick, he heals us. Dying on the cross, he saves us. Risen from the dead, he gives us new life. Living with you, O oh God, he prays for us. Therefore, we praise you 
joining our voices with choirs of angels and with all the faithful of every time and place who forever sing to the glory of your name. Holy, 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 Lord God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. With thanksgiving, we take this bread and this cup and proclaim the death and resurrection of our Lord. Receive our sacrifice of praise. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us, O God, that this meal can be a communion in the body and blood of our Lord. Make us one with Jesus and with all of his followers across the world who share in this feast. Unite us in faith. Encourage us with hope. Inspire us to love. That we may serve as your faithful disciples until we feast at your table one day in heaven. We praise you, eternal God, through Christ, your word made flesh, in the holy and life-giving spirit, now and forever. Amen. And now, friends, with the confidence that comes from being God's children, let's offer our prayers to the Lord. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord Jesus, on the night of his arrest, took bread, and after giving thanks to God, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant sealed in my blood shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. Every time you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you proclaim the saving death of the risen Lord until he comes. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Sisters and brothers, these are the gifts of God for the people of God. The body of Christ given for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. Friends, let's pray together. Father, we thank you that once more you have fed us with the bread of life. Thank you for our fellowship our living relationship with you and with one another in your family and with all of God's people on earth and in heaven, especially those who are nearest and dearest to us. We thank you, God, that nothing can ever separate us from your love in Christ, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be glory and honor now and forever. Amen.
Well, dear friends, go out now into the world in peace. Have courage. Hold on to what is good. Return no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak and help the suffering. Honor all people. Love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And now receive his blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord be kind and gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace, now and forever. Amen.